Thank you all for coming. I see a lot of uh, faces from our first meetup last month. It's good to see you back, and I see a lot of new faces too. Um, so thanks for coming back. Tonight we're going to talk about sundials. And as simple as this little thing seems that sits in your garden, telling time, usually wrong, <laughs> right? Um, as simple as it seems, it's actually a very complicated and ancient technology around which is wrapped all kinds of knowledge. It's an opportunity to touch so many topics in astronomy that it is priceless. I hope when you leave tonight you go, wow, my mind is blown, okay? So uh, hopefully uh, you registered when you came in. If you didn't, just when you leave, register with us if you would. Uh, these are the organizations that sponsor and are, uh, uh, organize this event, the Geauga Sky Watchers, the Foundation for Geauga Parks, the Geauga Park Districts, and uh, District, Geauga and Burton Public Libraries. Thank you uh, to Donna Mueller of this library for helping us set up today and allowing us to use this venue. And of course, uh, my organization, the Chagrin Valley Astronomical Society. I had our mission statement cycling through earlier. I hope you had a chance to read that. But our hope is to help make bright minds shine with the light of new knowledge. We inspire the next generation of working scientists in our community by looking up. And that's our motto, we look up, okay? Uh, you can join our club by being here. You can keep up with us by going to meetup.com and getting a free uh, membership so you can keep up with dates and times and pictures and uh, any information I want to release to the group to keep you uh, excited about astronomy. It's at meetup.com. All right, so sundials, latitude, and time. And time has something find shortly to do with longitude. So how to make a simple garden decoration uh, or how a simple garden decoration can teach us so much about the world around us. See if you don't agree with that statement by the end of this talk. I'm George Trimble. I'm the president of the Chagrin Valley Astronomical Society and I'm really glad to be here. So first what is a sundial? Yeah. It's like a dial that you can use to tell time based on where the shadow is. Yes, thank you for participating. So it is a time telling device. And strangely, in order to tell time, it has to be a really fine tuned little piece of technology, as you'll soon see. Otherwise, it won't work. So here's a 2,000 year old sundial unearthed recently in Italy. It doesn't look like a sundial you're used to seeing. Maybe from the last slide, aren't you used to seeing something more like this, mm -hmm. right? But this is also a sundial. In fact, they come in many flavors and we're gonna study a sundial today that looks like this, just like that. Now, this is actually a very sophisticated model, simple though it may look. And I've given you what you need to build one at home. And I'll walk you through that later. So a sundial, as this young gentleman, what's your name? Aaron? What is it? Jack. Jack. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's my mom's name. That, oh, okay, that's mom's name there. Okay. So, so it's an ancient time-telling device, but it can be modern too if you make one tonight when you go home. And it captures a very sophisticated understanding of the earth and universe and they are actually small models of the Earth. Now I want you to look at this. You imagine that this is the axis of the Earth that I'm holding. You know how the Earth spins, right? Okay, right, and it's tilted, right? Good, any flat earthers in here? All right, well, then, then you won't be surprised if I say that the Earth can be imagined as being a, a globe around this central disk which represents the disk of the equator. So this sundial is actually a little model of the Earth. All right? It's very cool. And even that flat sundial that you saw in the last picture is 
a variation on this theme. And this obviously, with that scooped out round hollow, looks like, it even has these inscribed lines, it looks like lines of latitude and longitude. And it is, in fact, a little representation of Earth. And imagine 2,000 years ago, they had this figured out, and the trigonometry and geometry associated with it. So, understanding requires astronomy, yes. Also some trigonometry. Who's brushed up on their trig? Nice. You're going to be bored today. Uh, because I'm not going to subject you to this. But we could, in a more advanced lesson, if you start feeling comfortable, and I hope to get you uh, up to speed on a little basic trigonometry before the year's out. Anybody can work a little basic trigonometry. I can make it easy. But today we will be covering some basic geometry that lets us understand these little toys, okay? So first, we're gonna need some tools. Tools, and I'm not talking screwdrivers, right? Mental tools, that's right. We need to get some tools. Now, who loves to spend an hour in school studying everything about the hammer? Raise your hand. No, no. Tools are boring sometimes, but it's what we do with them that makes them exciting. I'm gonna show you some little mathematical tools and you're gonna be like, ah. But when we go to use them, we're gonna be glad we studied them because tools become exciting when we see how they can build fascinating things. A hammer can make a house and a little mathematical theorem can build the most profound understanding of the universe. I hope by the end you marvel at the power of the tools I'm going to teach you. First, let's start easy, right? This is a picture of the moon. It's the moon at a very special time. It's a time when the moon is positioned here and the sun is shining from here and what has come right in between? Yeah, right on. Very good. All right, the Earth. This is a lunar eclipse. This is a moment of a lunar eclipse, and you see the Earth's shadow on there. Now, what shape is hinted at by the shape of that shadow? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> good answer, bad catch. Um, no bad catches, just bad throws. All right, so yeah, look at it, it's got a curve. In fact, you could even, if you were really slick, you could even guess at the size of the Earth if you could finish the sphere, right? If you could finish the drawing, you could get a sense of how big the Earth is compared to the moon. And uh, one of the ancient astronomers, and his name escapes me at just this moment, did take a guess based on that te technique. But, so there we have the moon. And interesting, all over the earth, when an eclipse of the moon occurs, whoever can see it, whether they're in California or New York, they see it at the same time. The event is just the event. It happens right there, but they all see it. And guess what? What? A few years ago, I forget what it was called, but I saw one of the major eclipses. You saw a solar eclipse, maybe? Yeah. Did you have to wear the glasses? Yeah. Uh, the, no, the protective. Oh, okay, so it was a lunar eclipse. Oh, like a blood red moon. Nice. It is interesting, and you can see some of that red color here and here. So, they all see the lunar eclipse at the same time, but when they, when they talk to each other, New York calls California, and they say, what time did that thing happen? Guess what? They don't agree on what time the event occurred. I'm gonna show you shortly that that implies that the Earth is round, and soon we'll see that it's not just a round disk, it's a sphere. That happened to us at the lunar eclipse. We were in Milwaukee, and mm -hmm. it happened so in Florida, so in it, it's, <laughs> it's nice. So now we've got a potential view of Earth here. This is the Flatlanders world, where these little guys here, <laughs> see those little guys? All right. Um, the sun rises here in the east. It comes up and it sets in the west, just like it does in your world. And 
Notice as the sun rises, instantly the light rays go all the way across the surface. And so each of these flatlanders, whether they live in the west or in the east, they both say, I just saw sunrise. Okay? Now, is that the way the world really works? No? no? Does some, do some people see the sunrise before other people? Yeah, it does. Yes, they do. Now, this is very interesting. It tells us that this hypothesis is wrong. It's the wrong view. It's the wrong model. Because if our Earth is circular, you're going to be on different sides. Brilliant. So one sees, it, it's not like the sun goes, I'm going to go all the way around the globe to you over there. You're right. So they will see it at different points, whereas they will see light while the other sees dark. Because once again, the planet walks out the sun's light. Right on, buddy. Give me five. You should be up here giving this talk. <laughs> you actually are doing what we call foreshadowing. Uh, you're going to see that that's an exact... You basically painted the next slide for me, okay? But let's look at another possibility. Is the world shaped like a bowl? Like this? Well, let's, let's explore. Yep. Okay. No, you're right. <laughs> Nope, it's not working, is it? <laughs> it's not a cereal bowl. Let's explore the consequences of this viewpoint, this hypothesis. Here's a guy in the east, and here's a guy in the west. The moment of sunrise, a beam of light skates the surface of the earth and hits the guy here in the west, and he says, sunrise! And this guy says, I don't see it. He's in the shadow. So, is this the way we experience it here on earth? And the answer, as you say, is no. So, let's investigate. Now, this is kind of a busy slide. Ignore this half, okay? <laughs> okay. Let's just do this half. So, just as you said, uh, diff people are located on different sides of a circular earth or a spherical earth. The light is coming from the east just at the moment it peaks over the horizon. He says, I see it, I see it. But the light just keeps going off into space and it misses this guy. It doesn't take a U-turn. So he says, I'm still in the dark. I don't see the sunrise yet. At some time later, the sun comes up around its arc. It's at noon. It's raining light down on this guy here. And he says, noon, right? And this guy's only just experienced it peak over his horizon. So it's just a little bit of light's coming down? Mm-hmm. Well, it's just coming over the horizon. It's like, I can only see you right there <laughs> not down here right there right mm -hmm. all right and we do, what do we call this moment for this guy here this is his sunrise that's right so um thank you this is actually how life works and so we can come to the conclusion can't we that the earth must be shaped like this as opposed to the other possibilities Yes, thank you. Now, here's something really cool. Now, a fellow by the name of Ptolemy, 2,150-something years ago, already knew this, and he, and he posited it as, as a, uh, a reason why we should not accept anything but a spherical Earth hypothesis. This is 2,000 years ago. How many thought that there were people in... Uh, a thousand years ago or 500 years ago that thought the world was flat. Yeah, for some reason that got into the textbooks, but it's false. Nobody ever thought that. Not educated people, at least. Okay, so Ptolemy, uh, Claudius Ptolemy knew this. Now look, we all know that as kids walk further away from us, they get smaller, smaller. smaller and smaller. But I want you to pay attention as they get further away, you can't see what shoes they're wearing. They seem to drop into the horizon. They sink, just like ships. Yes? Yeah, because um, they're, they're like going over the horizon, so it's almost like they're starting to like go around there, so you can't see. That's right, just like this, like this boat. It looks, yeah. he, he, the only thing you can see is anything above this red line, because a line of sight below that that would see the bottom of the ship has to go through the earth. You can't see through the earth. Just as you say. Yeah, this and guy's cleaning house. Unless you have laser vision. Hmm? <laughs> unless you have 
laser vision would work, right? So, not only as things go further away do they appear to get smaller, they seem to shrink down or sink down into the horizon. Mountains. Now, I've sailed on a sailboat to Tahiti solo, and way off in the distance I could see just the peak, and I thought, oh, I made it. And as I got closer and closer, it seemed to grow out of the water. The island grew bigger and bigger until I could see the whole thing, the closer you get. All right. So, here's this guy I was telling you about, Ptolemy, 2,154 years ago. Part 4, Chapter 1 of the Almagest, his famous textbook. It was the only textbook in astronomy for 1,500 years. Nobody even bothered to try to make another one because his was too good. He says that the earth too, let's listen to his words echoing down the halls of time to your ears. These are his words, 2,000 years old. That the earth too, taken as a whole, is sensibly spherical and can be grasped from the following considerations. I won't read the whole thing. We can see that the sun, moon, and other stars do not rise and set simultaneously for everyone on earth, but do so earlier for those more towards the east, later for those towards the west. We find that the phenomenon of eclipses, especially lunar eclipses, which take place at the same time for all observers, are nevertheless not recorded as occurring at the same hour, that is, at an equal distance from noon, by all observers, dot, dot, dot. He did my whole lecture. This is, <laughs> this is 2,200 uh, uh, years ago. Yeah, he had it all down. So now you understand what he's talking about. This was written in the language of his time, uh, which would have been Greek. It was preserved by translation into the Arabic language and came to the West, preserved by the Arabs. And so we have it now as a translation, uh, a famous translation by G.J. Toomer. So here's our first rule, our first tool, a screwdriver, if you will, in our toolbox, right? It's called the sphere rule. The earth, the earth. Now, really, I haven't established that yet. I just established that it's a circle. For all we know, it's a disk. And that ship is just sailing around the edge of the coin. But here's the fact. If you're out in the middle of the ocean and ships are sinking as they go away, they seem like they're sinking over the horizon, no matter which direction you look, as ships go away from you, they sink over the edge, and that's powerful evidence that we are on a sphere. Okay? All right. It's a lot of talk for, look, googly eye. It's like, uh, all right, a lot of talk to establish what we already knew. But starting with first principles is important. It makes you feel like you're building something strong. So who's used a protractor? Raise your hand. Right on, everybody. Okay, what does a pro protractor measure? You don't know what a protractor measures? Yes? Oh, yes, good. Here it comes. Right on. Angles. Good. All right. So, let's remind ourselves. A protractor has all kinds of markings on it, lots of numbers. It's confusing. We only really need one row of numbers. I'll show you here in a second. But... There's a little hole right here. There's always a little hole where you can put your pencil tip, and that's where you line up the intersection of two lines, and you're gonna measure the angle they make to each other, right? Lines can come uh, in an oblique angle, a right angle, or what's called an... A yes! There we go. All right, all right. So, let's see. Let's put the ground on there. I made it green, because it's grassy, okay? And in the ground, let's plant a pole. Oh, well, first, this is the scale we're going to use. See? <laughs> 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. We're going to plant the pole in the ground. And we see that the edge of that pole lines up right on 90 degrees. It, the tip of the pole and the grass intersect right at that little circle I showed you before, that little hole in the protractor. And so we measure on a protractor angles. Now... What if 
some nasty little kid after I did all that work comes along, sneaks up behind me as I'm walking away, and pushes that pole over to make a little joke on me. Ooh, little brat. <laughs> all right, now we measure 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. How many degrees would I have to push that pole back to get it back up? Yes. How many degrees do we have to push it back up? Yes, right on. I was worried that nobody would answer that one. <laughs> Very good answer, thank you. <laughs> All right, so there it is. We pushed it back up 20 degrees. Now, can you tell me how many does this add up to? Wait a minute. No, no. But good try. <clears throat> so we've got 70 degrees and we've got 20 degrees. How much does that add up to? Uh, 90. The original 90. Right. So you were talking about the whole pro. I know you were talking about the whole protractor. I should ask my question more carefully. But yeah, what I'm trying to say is that when we subdivide a right angle, that's a 90 degree angle, a right angle, when we subdivide it, all the little pie slices still add up to 90. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. Another little tool to stick in our toolbox. Can you remember that? Let's do another one. All right, that's 40. Now the pole fell over again, okay? So the question is, What's the leftover? I'm going to pick on somebody new now. What's the leftover amount? So, we, in other words, what's the angle from here, 90 to here? It's missing. I didn't have an, I don't have it listed, but we should. What? Yes! Yes, thank you. And that's in your head, you say 90 minus 40. That's the tactic. 90 minus 40, these kids are cleaning up. I'm sorry, parents. They are going to be pinging off the walls with sugar tonight. <laughs> All right, so there's 50 degrees, and you had the right answer. That's exactly right. All right. What am I doing now? All right, so we come to our next little tool. Our, our rule number three now, I think we're on. Or, yeah, number two. Rule number two. When you slice up a piece of pizza, like this 90 degree quarter of a pizza into smaller slices, the slices still add up to 90 degrees. It's the 90 degree rule. Say 90 degree rule. 90 degree. Right on. This is going to become important later. Those pieces add up to 90. If I cut it that way, it still adds up to 90. All right. Okay, gentlemen in the back. What special name do these... Uh, do these lines bear? We call these lines that never meet like train tracks. Right on. All right. Now, I'm saving the hard one for you. All right. All right. Parallel lines, right on. Now, when we do the following, we cut parallel lines by another line. We call this line a transversal. Now, nobody answer. I'm saving it for this one over here. Okay. What can we say about that angle and that angle? Yes? They're what? They're acute. They're acute. And are they, is one bigger than the other or are they the same? Yes. Good. Nice job. All right. So, the rule behind this, this is an important rule in geometry, actually. Um, if we, if we measure that one at 60 degrees, we're done. I already know the other one's 60. I don't have to measure it. It's provable, although I'm not going to go through all the rigmarole to do it. These two angles are the same because they occupy the same spot in the drawing in each of these, uh, re with respect to each of the lines, right? And so we call, okay, who knows what these angles are called? Their relationship to each other is not opposite. They're not alternate interior, but they are... All right, corresponding angles. And this brings us to our next rule. It's the corresponding angle rule. When parallel lines are cut by a transversal, 
corresponding angles are equal. Yes. Okay. Now, we're getting close to doing some, something about sundials. I told you I was going to try to put you to sleep before I got there. Let's explore this parallel ray conjecture. This is a, uh, a hypothesis, a conjecture, an idea that we're going to um, uh, posit and see if it turns out to be true. I've got the Earth, which is mostly water, so I made it blue. And I got a star. And I put the star really, really close to Earth. And so the light from that star comes from that star and it fans out just like a drawing of the sun. You know how the rays come out like wild hair? Okay. So the, these light rays hit different spots on Earth and they have an angle to each other. Do you see how it creates that red angle there like that? Okay. Now we can do an experiment by putting a guy in New York and a guy in California and measuring angles to stars, and guess what? They will not disagree on the angle that the light hits them. In other words, they will say that the light hits them parallel, not at an angle. You see these look like, like they cross right here. Now why is that? Let's look. Now let's pull the star a little further away. Now I want you to look here. Doesn't that almost starting to look parallel now? Yeah. Let's pull it further away and farther and farther and farther. And if the star is pulled infinitely far away, the light rays that rain down from that star on Earth are essentially parallel when they arrive. Do you see that? Yeah. Do you see how this one here looks almost as parallel as that one there? And it's because this angle here gets smaller and smaller, infinitely small, so this becomes infinitely um, large. So the parallel rule says the stars are so far away that the light from each star rains down on Earth in essentially parallel rays. So in my drawing, I'm not going to have the star shining its light down from a central point like a TP. I'm going to have it raining down like it's coming straight down like rain, okay? So we're getting close. This brings us to an essential question in astronomy and in sundials in particular. What is latitude? Now here's a picture of Earth. And you know, just as well as I do, that the real Earth doesn't have these little blue lines crossing it. That's an idea that we put on there. So we can say that my town in Africa is two over and one up. That's where my town lies. It's just like a street map we use. Latitude and longitude, right? Have you all experienced this before? All right. So. Here, we've cut out a little wedge of the earth and thrown it away so we could see down into the center of the earth. And I want you to see something cool here, watch. See that angle I just did? I'm gonna do it again. See it flashing? There's a red line and a green line. See it? Well, that angle, if we measure it with a protractor, measures 30 degrees. We could pick any angle. We could make it 50 or 70, and it would look different. But watch, if we were to take that angle and keep it on the center of the earth, keep the point at the center and just sweep it around in a circle, look what it would do. Did you see that? I'm going to do it again. Watch the red. You see it? It comes around the other side. That line is marked 30 degrees on earth because the angle that made it inside the earth was 30 degrees up from the plane of the equator from the plane of the equator. The angle coming up was 30 degrees. So we can get a formal definition that reads kind of like this. The imaginary parallel lines scribed on the surface of the earth by the tip of an imaginary line of a length equal to the radius of the earth with one end fixed at the center of the earth and the other end rotated 360 degrees around some fixed point uh, around at some fixed angle from the equator. Ugh. <laughs> Makes my eyes cross. <laughs> so let's do drawings. Those are easier to understand. So there's the plane of the equator. There's the dome of the top.
top of the Earth. We're only looking at the top half. Let's ignore the bottom half. Let's pretend the Earth is made of glass and we're going to draw a 30 degree angle up and as it traces around it makes an invisible cone inside the Earth. The base of the cone is a circle and the edge of that circle defines on the surface of the Earth the 30th line of latitude. And we could do it at 45 and we can do it at 70 degrees and look at that. Looks familiar, right? Now you know why that line is on, scribed on the surface of the earth here is called 60 degrees. We know where that angle came from. It's inside the earth. Okay. Why is this important? All right, let's look here. Let's finish this thought. This is a side view of earth from space. You see the lines of latitude. So happens that we live at 41.5 degrees north latitude, 41.5 north of the equator. If you're in south latitude, then the line is down here, but that's us on this line up here. So I'll draw it across as it sweeps through its circle, right? There it goes all the way back around the back into the beginning. Okay. And if I superimpose a map of the earth, you see that right up here near the Great Lakes above Florida, that's the United States. That's where we're at on this latitude line. Okay. All right. But how do we know that our latitude is 41.5 degrees? Yes. Oh, I should just throw this whole bag at you. Let's go home. We're done. We're done. That's the whole point. Yes. That's like worth four or five. It's, that's huge. Okay, good, good, good. So, she just gave the answer away. I'm going to cry. Oh, that was my big... <laughs> that was my big aha moment. All right. So, let's figure it out. But we're going to come up with your answer using first principles. The tools we've put in our toolbox, we're going to pull them out and we're going to discover what you just said. Here's the Earth, and this is a side view from space. The North Pole, the South Pole, okay? Let's put the equator in, shall we? And uh, you, right there. There you are, right there. And we know you have some latitude, but we don't know yet what it is. So we're just going to call it the latitude. We're going to hope we can discover it. Now follow carefully now, follow carefully. The line connecting the center of the earth going up to our feet is our latitude line. And if it goes straight out of our head up into the sky, the point directly above it, the, of, above us, we call that our zenith, our zenith. So I'm going to call this the zenith line, if I may. And you see the line that the zenith line makes with the equator, we call it the latitude. And standing right here, the earth looks flat to me. Don't you guys agree? It's really hard to look around you and discover the sphericity of the earth. Don't you agree? It's so big. The curvature is so small. And plus we have little rough variations like mountains and valleys and rivers and the trees are in the way. So let's just pretend that nearby us, the world is sensibly flat locally. It looks flat locally. And so I put in this little flat, we call it the horizon line because all around the horizon looks like just a flat disk to us. Okay? So, there's the North Star, and we're going to use one of our rules right now. Here's the rule. This is the parallel ray rule. Remember that one? I can draw it that way, can't I? I don't have to draw it like a tent. Yeah. Right? Like a TP. So notice one of the rays hits the North Pole and one of the rays from the North Star, which is way up there, hits us right at our feet. And it's that one we're interested in because it's that one we can see and measure. Okay? Now I'm going to extend that one down as if the Earth was made of glass, right down to the center of the Earth. So we can do a little bit of geometry. I told you we were coming to that. Didn't mean to scare you. Okay, now let's take, because this is getting messy, let's take a couple of these off to the side, these lines, so we can work with them separately and see if we can't discover something. So I took that line, I took that one there, right? I took the zenith line and I left all the else, uh, uh, other stuff out. If I tell you this 
is the latitude, and this is 90 degree angle, which it is because we can count 90 degrees up from the equator. We can count 90 degrees up and we hit the North Pole. So, what can you tell me? Okay, raise your hands. What can you tell me about this angle? Oh, okay. Um, I'm, okay, you. Good. So how would we write that here? What do we call that angle? We don't know what the latitude is, so we'll just call it the latitude, but we know it represents a number. You. What? Okay, fine. That's a sneaky little answer. It's not the one I was looking for. How would you calculate? Yes, you're right. You got me there. You got me there. How would you calculate the value of that angle? Go. Nope. You, have, you can't calculate a real number. You can create an equation. Yes. Yes! All right, good. She said it right. Remember the pizza principle. This is 90 degrees, and we subtract out this part of the pizza. What's left is 90 minus the latitude. 90 minus latitude. We still don't have an answer, but we're getting close. Okay? So I'm going to call it what I just... And thank you. That was perfect. 90 minus the latitude. Okay. So since that angle was from this drawing. It's this one right here, right? Isn't it the same angle? I put this right here, 90 minus latitude. That arrow is pointing to it. So we're starting to fill in the blanks in our drawing. Okay. Let's take some different lines aside and see what else we can discover. This time I took the light rays from the North Star, particularly the North Pole one and the one that hits us at our feet right here. That's here. And I took the zenith line. Now, can anybody tell me what angle is this? Yes, absolutely right. What's the angle? Um, is it corresponding? Yes, it's the corresponding angle, uh, corresponding angle rule. These are parallel lines. They're, they don't touch. These two lines are parallel. They're crossed by a transversal. These angles correspond and are therefore equal. Right? So that angle too must be 90 minus latitude if that angle is 90 minus latitude. And so let's go fill that back in in our drawing because that's this one. Okay? Right there. We're starting to fill in the blanks. All right. Now this one's tricky. Now I've taken these lines off of our drawing and let's work with those separately. Here's our zenith. Here's our horizon, same from there. We already discovered here 90 minus latitude is the value of this angle. Here's our little guy, U, okay? The question is that. Now we're getting to the magic moment, okay? Okay, guys, I'm back. What do you think? What's the value of this angle and what rule do you use to, to ascertain this? You? You got it? Have you got it, young man? No. Okay. So, anybody? Adults? You got it? 60. No? Good guess, though. Here. I appreciate the try. Say again? No, that's, that's this angle. You're getting close, though. <laughs> Anybody? As usual, you got the right rule. Now put it together. What's the formula? Come on now. Yes. Uh, it's going to be 90 minus whatever this is, right? Here's 90. This is a wedge of that 90, so part of the 90 is missing. What's left over is 90 minus this. So it's 90 minus 90 minus the latitude. Okay? Look. 90 minus 90 minus the latitude. That's what's left over here. Now this is the worst algebra you're going to see for the rest of the night. Promise. I'm so sorry. But we can now... Can we call this negative here, this minus? It's actually a negative one, which can be multiplied into the interior. 
and we can simplify it as negative 1 times 90 is negative 90, and negative 1 times minus latitude becomes positive latitude. So we have 90 minus 90 plus latitude. What's 90 minus 90? Zero. That's right. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> there you go. You got your first one. <laughs> Yeah, a negative times a negative turns that latitude positive. This is like multiplication because that's in parentheses. Okay? So, it simplifies. The 90s disappear. They cancel each other. 90 minus 90 is zero. And what we're left with is just the latitude. So this angle is the latitude. Whoa! We're back to what you said. This angle is the same as that angle. Can you go to the center of the earth with your protractor in the lava? <laughs> yeah. And the molten spinning core and measure that angle? If you try. Yeah, you if, can. If you were lava, I would like to go through yeah. anything is possible. Anything's possible. Okay, you got to have your special suit. That's right, magma proof. Nice word, magma. <laughs> right on so what we're at now is this we can discover our latitude if we just know oh wait let, let me fill it in so let's fill it in that's latitude and that is that angle so we can discover our latitude here if we just know the angle that this this star the light from the star makes to our horizon we look at the horizon we measure the angle up to the north star this angle is our latitude magic. magic yes look at this I'm just like oh yes it's beautiful it's beautiful <laughs> eloquent eloquent okay so this is powerful because no matter where you are in the northern hemisphere if the north star is visible you can discover your latitude on earth ancient sailors would use this technique to ensure that they were sailing either east or west constantly any deviation from a constant latitude by measuring the North Star would tell them they're wandering up or down. The ancient sailors couldn't determine their longitude very well, but latitude, yes. And this is powerful because we need this number. We need to know where we're at. Turns out 41.5 degrees for us if we're going to make a sundial work. All right, so tonight, homework. Fun work, fun work. Take your protractor, turn it upside down. Tape a straw uh, on, along the straight edge on top. From the central hole, hang a string with a little weight like a rubber, what is that thing, a stopper or a nut or a paper clip, something to weigh it down. And as you move the protractor, the string stays pointed down towards the center of the earth so that when you look through the straw, at the North Star up here, that number will be what? That's so cool! You can discover your latitude tonight. So make one of these at home, okay? Using a protractor. As you see the North Star come into the straw, centered within the little circle, ask Dad to shine, or Mom to shine a flashlight on the side and read off the number. It'll be 41 and a half degrees. Very, very cool. You just did okay, some just, real astronomy. That is just awesome. It is, yes. Ah, so do you guys know what the Big Dipper is? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Marty's going to kill me. Is he in there? Good, good, good. No, no, don't. Oh, okay, he's going to see me. So I'm going to get the star. I'll, I won't be able to name any of these stars in the right order, but the Big Dipper kind of looks like this. Okay, and I probably missed one in there somewhere, right, Marty? Like that? <laughs> I knew it! All right, but it kind of makes a handle and a pot, right? The Big Dipper. Now, the edge of the pot of the Big Dipper, these two stars, they line up, and up there is a very faint star all by its lonesome. That is the North Star. So look for the Big Dipper and look north. You've seen it before? 
Uh, <laughs> so, I knew somebody was going to ask that question. That's a great question. What do you do in the Southern Hemisphere? There's a really good answer for that, and it requires building a more sophisticated pyramid of knowledge than I can present tonight. <laughs> but basically, you can discover the stars that are on the equator in Orion's belt, and you can move another direction. It's much more complicated. It'd take me another 20 minutes to get you there, but it can be done. There is no star at the southern point. Um, there's something called the Southern Cross, and if you go a certain number of Southern Cross distances away, that's the approximate location of the Southern Point. But um, there isn't an object that you can look through and discover your latitude, your Southern Latitude. Luckily, most of civilization developed above the equator. All of Greek and Roman and all of uh, European history and the history of astronomy was built north of the equator, and that's... Um, that's highly ethnocentric because there are some civilizations that were able in the southern hemisphere to navigate uh, incredible distances, the Polynesians in the southern hemisphere without the North Star. So I don't want to discount their astronomy. But most of what we call uh, uh, Western astronomy, of course, was developed above the equator. Okay, so. So uh, finally, what's this got to do with sundials? I was here for the sundials. Okay. Well, to tell time from the sun, you need to know your latitude. Now, this is very cool. If you poke a stick in the ground the way they used to try to tell time, it doesn't work very well. But if you tip that stick so that it points to the North Star, now you're on to something. Okay? By poking a stick in the ground pointed at the North Star, you create an axis. And I'm going to show this to you. Wait a second. I'll get to you in a second. That's, I'm sure it's a burning question. This axis will be parallel to the Earth's axis. Now, it looks weird because our, ac our, our latitude is 41.5. So, so this angle will be 41.5 pointing at the North Star. And you're like, wait a minute. Up is like this, but the Earth is spinning like this. Very weird. Now, watch. If you put a disk over that axis, now the disk is aligned parallel to the equator. This disk is actually the plane of the equator now. And now you've got a model of Earth. And it's oriented properly like Earth. And now we have a chance at telling time. Now watch. You had a question. Ant. Uh, uh, also, Ray, are you able to use a compass to, like, in the day, if you aren't showing yes. the Yeah. Right on. That's awesome. And you brought up a point that I was going to make later. If you want to set up your sundial during the day and you don't have to wait till night and it's cloudy, just use your compass on your phone. But I have to warn you, the little, that little compass on your iPhone usually is set for magnetic north. <laughs> and there's magnetic variation all over the earth. So set it, change the settings to true north. And it'll be off here locally. The variation is as high as 6 or 8 degrees. At least it was when I was sailing on Lake Erie. Um, so, so we slip the disk. Now that disk is parallel to the equator. And you have created a small model of the Earth. Now this is a sundial. And it should look a little bit familiar to you by now, right? Yeah. See that? So awesome. This sundial is called an equatorial sundial. Look at the rooftop here. We're in China. Yes? Is it an, another reason it has to be at an angle is because if it's straight up, the shadow won't go around properly? Oh my gosh. Yeah. These guys, are, this is brilliance here. I'm <laughs> shocked and amazed. That deserves two. That's right. The shadow will not go around and tell time properly. The timing will be wrong. The angles will be off. And it'll only work for that day. You could set up a sundial. It would work for that day. And then the next day, it would be a different sundial that you need. We're looking for a universal set of lines, universal. See, these lines have to be working every day to indicate time. Question? Come on, comment. Okay, fine. You look like it, though. You had this intelligent look on your face. Okay. So you see this little spear going through the center of the disk? It's oriented up from the ground for the latitude of China. 
whatever it is, I don't know. It looks to me like 40 something, maybe 48, but whatever. And notice the lines scribed on the surface of the stone. Do you see that? Yeah. And notice the sun is shining on the stick. By the way, let's get cool. This ain't a stick, it's not an axis. It's not a stick in the ground, it's called a noman. That's the formal language in sundial terminology. Noman starts with a silent G. Gnoman. So are the lines on the sundial, are they oriented with longitude and latitude lines? They are, or, these represent really timelines and they are longitudinal in nature. I'm, I'll show you what it means shortly in the next slide, yes. Do the lines represent like where the shadow will be at every hour? That's exactly right. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. One for you, one for you. Good questions, guys. Cleaning house. Okay. What can I tell from this picture? If this, is, if this stone represents the plane of the equator, and we know China is in the north, the sun must be below the equator because it's shining on this stick, this gnomon, and casting a shadow on the underside of the device from underneath. That tells me it's winter time in China because the sun is below the equator. The sun varies throughout the year. The sun varies. Um, here's the North Pole. The Earth spins like that. The equator is right here, striped line. Sometimes the sun is up here in summer and down here in winter, and it varies uh, by 23.4 degrees on either side of the equator throughout the year. When the sun is in the north, we call it what? Oh, fine, but still, you've got to answer my question before you get one. Sun is in the north, we call it? Uh, okay, who, who said summer? Right on. Okay, your question. Ah, you can. There is something called a nocturnal that uses the north star to tell time, and, it's, and the constellations that go around the north star, like the Big Dipper, uh, where they are as the night goes is like a clock. The constellations circle the North Star, and so it's like a big clock in the sky. Does Good question. I'm just curious. So, this might have that the stick mm. is not in the ground. Mm. Does that mean that the sun is not shining on the ground? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. As long as the stick is oriented, we call this parallel transport. As long as I take it like this, move it around, as long as it's still pointing at the north and I haven't done this to it, we're good. Okay. Yes? Okay. All these lines? Like the ones I drew here? So this thing here is a piece of string I glued into place. It represents the equation of time. I'm glad you asked. What is the equation of time? You're going to know before the end of this lecture. This represents the 90 degree horizon line that I glued. Uh, it's 90 degrees away from Cleveland, which I've indicated here. So this is a very modified globe. But we're gonna get, we're gonna get to that equation of time, so I'm very glad you asked, thank you. All right, so, a lot we can learn now that we've developed a little knowledge just enough to be dangerous, right? <laughs> we knew that it was winter time when that picture was taken. So our goal is to figure out, well, how do we draw those lines? How far apart? How many? Well, we want each line to represent an hour on a sundial. And how many hours in a day? Yes. Yeah. That's right. You earned another candy. Look at you cleaning up. All right, 24 hours in a day. 300, okay. Who wants to do some calculator work for me? Hold on, I got somebody I, I'm going to pick out. Uh, you did calculator work for me last time. I want to get this guy drawn in. Okay, do some math for me, buddy. 360 degrees in a circle. 24 hours in a day. How many when we divide? 360 divided by 24. Yeah, hang on to that calculator, okay? This one's for you. 15 degrees per hour, right? Each, so if we divide the circle into 24 parts, each of these parts has to be 24, um, 15 degrees, 15 degrees. That's the goal if we want to represent each line is an hour. 15 degrees separation because 
Either you could look at this two ways. The sun goes from noon all the way around the earth in 24 hours, and I open my eyes again, boom, boom, it's right there again. 24 hours, it makes the circle. Or in reality, the sun's not really moving. The earth is actually turning. There it went. There it is again. Okay, 24 hours. So the earth turns 360 degrees in 24 hours. That's 15 degrees per hour. So, check this out. If you wanted to draw these lines, and you don't have to, because I did it for you on a sticker, and I'm gonna show you what to do with this pretty soon. So do you remember this? If you draw a circle, and then without changing the, the legs on the circle, you put the point somewhere on the edge, and you just make off a mark, and make off a mark, and make off a mark, and you walk that thing around, putting the point at the last mark each time. By the time you get around, you've marked out six. Okay, what's 360 divided by six? 60. What are you coming up with? 60 degrees, yes. Another candy right here. See, I'm, I'm saving your stash because you're going to do a couple calculations for me. All right, so we've got 60 degrees. Now, we're close because 60, if we divide each of these in half, then we've got 30s. And if we divide each of those in half, we're down to 15s, right? That's what we need. So we need a way to divide. Now watch. So there's the, there's the angles. It looks a little bit like mine, right? But the angles are too big. So we need a way to subdivide that 60 degrees into two 30s, two pieces of pizza instead of one. So watch. I haven't even changed my compass yet. Okay, I haven't changed the angle distance. I'm just gonna come here from A and sweep out an arc and then to B and sweep out another arc and they're gonna intersect like that. And then I can connect the center point where they intersect to the center of the circle and now I've cut that 60 degree angle into two 30s. And guess what, I can take that compass, not change the setting at all, put the point right there at that intersection on the side of the circle, and now I go walking around again, and I'll just end up walking out the halfway points. Now I've got that thing down to 30 degrees. Do it again, the whole process knocks it down to 15 degree slices. And now you've got what I drew, but I used some cool software to make it fast. <laughs> okay? All right, so that's if you wanted to draw your own with just a compass. So that's the goal right there. Oh, wait a minute. What's missing? Yeah, why? Why don't I care about these lines? Yes. Yeah, right on. You don't have any sun at night, so you don't need nighttime. And I wanted to leave room for a very special chart called the chart of the equation of time. What this guy was asking about. What's that string on there? All right. All right, buddy, my little calculator savant. Okay. So, the side of the sundial that's underneath is the side that's gonna catch the sun during the winter, and the side that's on top will catch the shadow in the summer. So, there's gotta be numbers on both sides, and that's why you're sundial faces, those stickers have numbers on both sides. But for the winter, we number them from four, well here, five in the morning on yours to seven at night. They go counterclockwise. And then on the front of the device, you see they go clockwise. And notice that the 12 o'clock noon mark is the, is the one that kisses the ground. Once you've got that, and the sundial is arranged so that the Noman is pointing to the North Star, you're ready to tell time. So depending on what time of the year it is, you switch it over to the other Nope. Side. The sun does the switching. The sundial, you could just, you could actually pour a little uh, cement in, the, in a hole in the ground, put the sundial a little bit into it, let it harden into place, never move it again. And the sun does the moving. Does the area with no numbers vary on the size because it's darker for different amounts of time? Yeah, so the, the, you're right. 
the darkness, the amount of dark, I use the maximum amount of darkness, uh, uh, rather the minimum amount of darkness here. So sometimes you won't get a shadow at 4 a.m., particularly in the winter, because winter nights are long. Uh, but I, I put it here so that in the best of days, and actually yours says five to seven, but on the best of days in the summer, you've got the maximum amount of time telling ability. Okay? That's a really good question. All right, so once you've got the stickers put on both sides of your equator, okay, and you stick a little coat hanger through the middle, like I've done here, those are gonna be available at the back. I didn't pass them out because I don't want anybody to poke their eye out. Strongly recommend parental supervision. <laughs> um, I've also printed on your sundial paper, there's a little strange Z-shaped thing. It wasn't supposed to be a Z, it was supposed to be a kite, but two of the lines didn't print. I don't know why, but I'll show you here in a second. You can cut that thing out and fold it in half and it's gonna make you a little triangle that is exactly our latitude, and when you hold it behind your device, you want it to be parallel. See how the noman is parallel with the edge of that triangle? 41.5 degrees. You have to adjust how much of the hanger sticks through to get that angle just right, but once you got it, you wanna fix it in place with some super glue, okay? Um, we already answered that question. So let's talk about how to build your sundial real quick. So this is, you guys see that little funny Z on your paper? Yeah. It was supposed to look like that and that. It was supposed to look like a little kite. So just take a ruler and a pencil and connect the missing lines. They were too faint to show up when I changed it to a PDF file. That's the what happened. So you're gonna cut this out and then you're gonna fold it on the diagonal and that's gonna be the angle you need. You see that? Okay, good. Sorry about the mess up, mess up. So let's talk about your sundial. I gave you a computer disc, didn't I? Okay. You're going to cut out the sundial parts, okay? And notice if you fold it in half on just that right line on the back, there's a little split already cut. It's already cut. See that? What I want you to do, okay, it's, it's, cut, it's exactly the right size for this thing. So get it on there and then fold it off like this. Okay. Peel that off and then lay it down. And see how it's, if you try to pull the whole sticker off, it's gonna curl up. You're gonna be trying to put, it's gonna be a mess. And it paper tears if you try to peel it back off. Now this side, all you gotta do is go get that edge of that sticker and you're almost done. Okay, easy for me to say. Yeah. What's that? So the, the, stick, the paper I gave you is a peel and stick sticker. And there's little, there's little sporings on the back. Um, it's pretty cut. And you can actually, there we go. There we go. And there comes the other half right there. And now I can fold that down just right from the center, sweep it off. Perfect alignment. What's that? No, no, don't do it now. Um, we don't have time. And I thought I had a little, um, I also supplied you with those little felt things. Those are also sticky. And you take one of them and you, they're different sizes. You've got a little bit smaller one. Yours is a little bigger. But there's a circle there for each of the different sizes you might have gotten. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And so you just peel this and you find the circle that it seems to center on and you just pop it in place. See? Yeah, and yours will fit into the bigger circle. Doesn't matter. I was being really creative at the office store. <laughs> and then you do it for the back, the other side, and you put that other little felt thing I gave you on the other side and you made a little sandwich. And then you can take that little metal hanger rod. Uh, I cut, can you imagine me cutting a hundred of these things? I have, all all my clothes that were on metal hangers are on the floor right now. My wife is going crazy. But this is where mom and dad need to help. You need to take it and drive it through the felt out to the other side without perforating your hand and going to the doctor. But I'm a doctor. I work at Lake West Hospital. Just come see me if you do it, okay? All right. And then you just have to adjust 
how far in or how far, how far out that you put the thing. If it's longer, it'll tip this forward. If it's shorter, it'll tip down like this. But you've got to adjust it so that your little folded piece like this, see how I folded it over? Gets the angle just right, you see? Then you've got a working sundial. So you don't have to, actually. Um, but ideally, yes, absolutely. So you'd want the 12 o'clock mark to line up with the 12 o'clock mark. Okay. Now, if it's not, you can, just, you can just roll it so that the 12 in the winter lines up on the bottom, kissing the ground. It's not going to kill anything. But if you want to make something that's fixed and doesn't move, yeah, absolutely. Does it, does it matter what side we use for the Yes. Side? That's a great question. So look, this one's wrong. We've got to flip this little guy down like this. So the equation of time curve right there is on the, uh, on the up facing side. So it's this side that's going to adjust and you're going to kind of get down here like this and you're going to measure, does it do the angles line up, right? You're going to look from the, you can put it behind and look from the front and see if those angles line up. Okay. All right. So now you can make your own sundial. So here's that picture again. See how I'm making sure that I've... S now, at the end, once you get the length right and you've got this thing centered just right, drop a whole bunch of super glue on, onto that felt on each side and it'll soak in and it'll turn hard as a rock like a piece of wood. And then you can freeze it into place. Just hold it for a while and it'll freeze in place. And you don't want this thing like bent like this. You want it perpendicular, right? So, and the length has to be right, as I said. But then you've got yourself a working sundial. Pretty cool little tool. So you see that we can idealize our sundial like this. The equator, the axis of Earth's rotation. Let's talk about why it works. We're coming into the home stretch now. Here's the North Star, light shining down, the equator. There's you. What's your first name? Isaiah. I Isaiah? There's Isaiah right there. And there's his local horizon. We're going to extend the light down just for geometric purposes. And look, remember the sundial from the last page? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that look a little bit like, uh. like what's it the, what the Earth is doing? Doesn't the Earth make its own little sundial? Mm -hmm. Ours is a little model of the Earth. Okay? Let's put a sun up there in the sky. It's summer for us. It's summer because the sun is above the equator. Here's the equator. Okay. And so the light shines down. And look, the little angles. It hits the, it hits the gnomon. A little shadow is made. It hits the Earth's axis, which is like a gnomon. A little shadow can be made if the Earth was glass. And so the one does what the other does. Now let's put this sun down below the equator and it shines up from below. In the winter time, we'll be reading the time from the bottom of this sundial. Just like it does on the earth, it's as if we were at the center of the earth taking measurements. See that? That's why I said, I know it's winter time in China. China's in the northern latitudes, the shadow's on the bottom. Now let's look down from the top. Now, I'm looking down from the North Pole. The Earth looks like a circle. The equator is the biggest one. And our latitude... Oh, let's turn us right up. Don't mean to make you dizzy. Our latitude here, okay, is a smaller circle. Bigger circle at the equator, smaller circle. Bigger circle is the equator. Smaller circle is 41.5 degrees north latitude. And this little yellow spot just represents the axis of Earth's rotation. Now... We're going to put our sundial onto the Earth, too, looking from the top. It's smaller. It has an axis. It has its own little equator. Now watch this. Got the sun shining. This is the top view. I don't know if the sun's above the equator or below, but it's right there, shining. And it casts a shadow on each of those sundials. You see it? Now watch what happens as the Earth rotates from west to east giving the appearance that the sun is traveling the opposite direction. What? So, as the Earth rotates, the sun starts hitting it from different... 
Yes. Yeah. That's how it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're catching on. And then the sun creates a shadow. Yes. Yes. Now watch. Now the Earth's rotation is going to carry the sundial with it. Oh, there, we're going to call that noon. Okay. The noon mark. Now watch what happens. The Earth has caused the sundial to rotate as it turns with it. Yeah. And so the noon mark has moved away, but so has the Earth's noon mark. And the shadow is now 60 degrees away from the previous shadow, 15 degrees an hour. It must be 2 o'clock now, 2 hours, right? And see, this is how a sundial tells time. It mimics what the Earth is doing. It tells us about Earth's rotation. And so it turns out that the shadow on an equatorial sundial, which is what we're talking about here, moves at a constant velocity. It moves through equal angles and equal times. Okay? Now you may say, that sundial doesn't look at all like the sundials I know about. I've seen these. What's the relationship? I want you to imagine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, Hang on to that thought for a second, because I want you to see. You can't guess this one, okay? I want you to imagine that the North Star is so bright, so bright that it can cast shadows on objects that the light hits, okay? And I want you to imagine this is made of glass instead of plastic, and that the lines are marked on there with a Sharpie on a glass disc. And the North Star is right there, and its light is so bright it's shining on this. The shadow this casts on the table is this. The lines are preserved in this projection technique, however angles are not. So the angles will not be equally spaced and it's more complicated geometrically. You have to use a little trigonometry. Here's a horizontal sundial and notice that the, the, the angular difference between 9 and 10, it's just after 3, the difference between 9 and 10 is much smaller than the angle between 7 and 6. Do you guys see that? These sundials, the shadow moves at increasing speed later in the day or earlier in the day because it has to cover the same amount of time but different distances for that time. So it had, the shadow moves at different speeds. So these sundials are not only specific for latitude, but you have to have a different one um, uh, what, what was I trying to say? You have to have a different one of these for every latitude. Whereas this, you can take down to Florida. And the only thing you have to adjust is this, the angle. This one, not only do you have to adjust the angle, you also have to adjust the, you know, the gnomon angle. You also have to adjust the angles between the hours. This is a more complicated sundial. Yes? So if you're planning to go somewhere else, just make a new sundial. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. All right. So the shadow receiving surface lays flat. That's nice because you don't have to duck underneath. Bye now. To look in the winter. It's a projection of the equatorial sundial. There's angular distortion, but lines are still lines. Uh, we talked about this. And the hour angle's different each from the next. And the latitude is different for these sun. The, the sundial is very different looking for each latitude. You can use tra uh, trigonometry or you can use geometry to calculate one of these. But we're not going to do it. It's a little too complicated for the time we have. So finally, reading a sundial. I'm going a little over time. I'm sorry. You don't have to stay. You can leave if you like. I'll finish off here. The time on the face of a sundial is almost always wrong. That's why when you go to the museum and you look at it and you go, yeah, whatever. Because it doesn't match up with your watch. What use is that thing? You guys are going to walk out of here with this esoteric wisdom, this knowledge that sets you apart from all the other people standing around looking at that thing, looking at their watches and going, you're going to know the magic to transition what it says into what your watch says within minutes of accuracy. You need to apply three correction factors to adjust the time to match that on your watch. It's really your watch that's wrong. 
The sundial is telling good time locally. It's the right local time. The problem is we mess with that for our own convenience. We need to apply what's called a longitude correction, the equation of time, and daylight savings time correction. Okay, longitude. Ring, ring, ring. England is calling. It's noon here in England. It's <laughs> noon. And you're like, why did you wake me up? I'm still sleeping. Right? So you, you hit your little stopwatch and go back to sleep. You get up. You uh, make coffee. I don't know, you kids drink coffee? Make some bacon and eggs? No coffee. Right. And finally, the sun is due south of you. The sun is due south of you. You look south, you look up, and there's the sun. It started low, it got high, and it's just about to arc down into the utter west and go to sleep. But at that moment, it's noon for you, and you hit your stopwatch again and say, Whoa! Whoa! Five hours have passed since I got that call this morning, and that guy in England woke me up. What does that tell you about your longitude? Five hours, 15 degrees per hour, calculator buddy, 15 times five. You can discover, 75, yes. You have discovered your longitude. That's Greenwich, England, is where we call zero for these divisions called longitude. These are not parallel like these lines. These never intersect. These all intersect at the North and South Pole. And these indicate the Earth's rotation in hours. Each division of 15 degrees is an hour. And so we're five divisions away from England. And five hours later, we can estimate, based on that phone call, that we must be at 75 degrees longitude. That's if you live in... New York. We live a little further than that. <laughs> All right, so here's the problem. If I say meet me at noon and you're, you're standing over here and I'm standing over here, we got a problem because noon for me is a few seconds earlier than noon for you, right? Our sundials won't match by a few seconds and the farther apart we are, the more problems we have coordinating time. So we said, ah, heck with it. Let's just all set our watches the same way. All of us in this time zone right here, and that's us here at Lake Erie, in this eastern time zone have just arbitrarily decided to set our time based on the guy's watch at the 75th meridian, or line of longitude, which goes through New York. We all pretend like it's that our watches are telling time like New York time, but the sun doesn't know that. The sun is telling a different time. Yes? Because, like you said, the, the Earth is a sphere. So what time is for us here might not be the same somewhere else. So, for instance, yeah. when we were visiting family, we would visit from, uh, we lived in Milwaukee, and we visited family all the way down in Florida. Yeah. And I think it was a one-hour, two-hour difference. Yeah. And we would wake up at, uh, say, 5 o'clock for them, and... We'd be like, oh man, five o'clock, it's okay, we can start getting up now. No, it's actually four, if not three yeah, o'clock. Yeah, you, you got to be careful calling family because you'll wake yeah, someone up if you, <laughs> if you think it's there on your time. So we set our watches as if we lived on the 75th oh, meridian, know. as if when the sun is at noon at that meridian, it, we pretend like it's at noon at our meridian, but it's not. It still hasn't got there yet. The sun has yet time to go. So there's, there's New York. That's, their watches agree with what the sun says, but that's us. Now, check this out. We have to add what's called a longitude correction. Here in Ohio, 81.2 degrees is our longitude. The meridian we set our watches to is 75. The difference is 6.2 degrees, and we know 6.2 degrees at a rate of 15 degrees per hour, right? 6.2 times, and here's the ratio, 60 minutes over 15 degrees. I put the 15 degrees on the bottom of the division or the ratio so that degrees will cancel and leave minutes. So 6.2 times 60 divided by 15 is 24.8 minutes. 
every time we read a sundial in Ohio, we take that time and we add 25 minutes to it approximately. And we're correcting it so that it's getting closer to what our watch says, but not exactly. So our watches always show time that's 25 minutes later than it really is astronomically. It's as if we were living in New York, but we're not. The sun disagrees. So we add 25 minutes to whatever's reading on the sundial. You can write that down. Remember that number. It works anywhere in Ohio. Add 25 minutes to any sundial you see and you'll be safe. That's the longitude correction. It gets you closer to your watch time. Now, you asked a question earlier, Joe. You asked a question about this line on my map. It's called the equation of time. Now check this out. There's you. You're facing south on the grass. South, east, west, right? The sun rises and sets along a path in the sky like this. There's the sun at the moment of noon when it's highest in the sky, dead south of you. Now, you might expect that if you had a little stopwatch in your hand, you could close your eyes, set the stopwatch, and 24 hours later, ding, it goes off. You could open your eyes and you would expect the sun to be right back where it left, right? It's as if it didn't even move. But, uh-oh, uh-oh, it's, it's a little late, just a few minutes. Or maybe it's a little early. You open your eyes and it's already past noon. What happened? Dr. Tremble said it would take 24 hours exactly. But it doesn't. It's either late or, or, or early throughout the year. Only a couple of times is it right on time. The problem is the sun is a poor chronometer. It's a poor watch. It's not that regular. Sometimes it's early, sometimes it's late. On average, it's right on time. On average, it's a 24-hour cycle. If you take the whole year, the amount that it's late adds up each day for a while, and then it gets shorter, and then it's on time, and then it gets ahead of itself, and then it backs up. And throughout the year, these numbers add, add up so that for October, Early October, the sun is 13 minutes, is the, what we call the equation of time. It's 13 minutes, and we have to subtract this because the sun's early. We have to subtract. We always subtract the equation of time from whatever time we read. So whatever the time it says, you add 25 minutes, longitude correction, and every good sundial will have this little graph on it. You have to look up the number and subtract it. So subtract... 13 minutes. Or if you're in February, you subtract minus 14. Okay. So subtracting a negative is adding, right? You have to watch the algebra. All right, so you have to subtract the equation of time. And the reason for this is that we have to ask Kepler, Kepler's equations. Kepler discovered that the Earth really isn't going around the sun in a circle, it's an ellipse. And when the Earth is close to the sun, it moves faster. And when it's further away, it moves slower. Just like a speed skater. When she spins and pulls her arms in, she goes faster. Angular momentum is conserved. It's a little pretty deep concept. But it's the reason for this variation, it's a small variation, just a few minutes. But it has to be taken into account. And you just look, and I put that little graph on your, you can look it up for yourself for whatever day, what the correction is. And finally, the last correction is daylight savings time. Basically, adults went crazy, and they decided in the summer, they were just going to arbitrarily spring our clocks forward by an hour. So if it's summertime, you've got to spring, you have to spring the sundial forward by an hour, too. And that happens between March 10th and November 3rd. Those are the three co corrections you need. Add 25 minutes, subtract the equation of time off the graph, and add an hour if it's daylight savings time. All right, we're done. <laughs> Few little announcements. There's some snacks in the back if you want them. If there's some parents that want to get involved in helping us with the, organizing these events, we need some help and we'd love to have you. Um, uh, 
this club won't be anything if we don't have people involved in helping and coming. So I have a question. Yeah. Are you able to use this side also, or is it only this side that works? Both sides work. This side works in the summer. This side works.